everyone, I am Kimberly, the 5-Minute NP. The 5-Minute NP was born out of my belief that small, incremental changes can drastically change the trajectory of your life. Our genes do not have to determine our lifespan. My goal through this podcast is to act as a roadmap that bridges the gap between knowledge and action, leading to you living your healthiest, happiest, longest life. Welcome to the 5-Minute NP Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 5-Minute NP Podcast. In this interview, you will meet Dr. Jeffrey Redeker, who wrote the fascinating book, Cured. He is on the faculty of Harvard Medical School, the medical director of McLean Adult Psychiatry and Community Affairs at McLean Hospital, and he is the chief of behavioral medicine at the Good Samaritan Medical Center. His research, which he details in Cured, with remarkable individuals who have had spontaneous remissions from incurable diseases, has been featured on The Oprah Winfrey Show and Dr. Oz. He has spent nearly 20 years studying spontaneous healing. His research shows truly our physical reality is created in our mind, as well as to heal, we have to get to the root cause of the disease. In this interview, we dive into some of the stories he shared in his book, Cured, and what it took for them to heal and takeaways for all of us to live the life we were meant to have to live in love and what he calls the healing mode, and to live free from disease and free from regrets. Welcome to the 5-Minute NP Podcast. Welcome, Jeffrey. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to share your book. I have to tell you, as I was coming, you know, I'm at the bookstore and I love, I actually love to interview authors and I just find it, you know, I feel like if they're they're an expert in this area. So who else would I w- want, not want to talk to? Um, but your book, the title cured, it just struck me because I thought who doesn't want to be cured, whether it's um, from a terminal illness or a mental illness, or really just escaping from a, a life that's imprisoning us, you know? Um, so it kind of caught my eye. And as I mentioned in my email with you, you know, losing my parents young, um, as I went through your case studies in this book, I thought, wow, you know, I look at my mom, I kind of mentioned she had died young and it was all about those things you talk about. It was the chronic stress, the lack of sleep, the loneliness, the isolation. And it was just like, wow, if she would have known all these things, would it have been different for her? You know? Um, so yeah, I, I would love for you just to kind of talk about, you know, a little bit about your diverse background and what prompted you to go to Brazil and end up writing this book. Yeah, well, there's a lot to that. You know, I think sometimes the personal is most universal and this, you know, I'm a physician, but the truth is this has this journey of doing this research and listening to these amazing stories of people who have medical evidence for recovery from incurable illnesses has changed me in every way as a physician and also personally. And it's also healed my own body and so and changed my outlook on so many things in life. So I think these stories have been very inspiring for me and helped me understand that a medicine of hope and possibility really exists. It's, so I come from a small farm in, in Indiana. Uh, my parents were very conservative. My dad left the Amish tradition um, it's, it's, there's, it's hard to say when it's, it's, I don't fully, I think there's stories that I'm never going to know. So it's, <laughs> there's a lot of things I don't know about that, but we left the Amish community officially when I was two years old, but I think there was a lot of steps before all that. Um, we moved to a farm 30 miles away and I grew up, um, uh, working on the farm a lot and going to school. Amish believe that you don't need education, you need the Bible. And the Bible is sufficient for all the knowledge that you need. Those kinds of statements were made in our home a lot, but I did go to public school. But part of the difficulty for me was I would go to public school during the day and then go home to a really different environment at home where TV, radio, store-bought clothing, worldly things, all those kinds of things were deeply suspect and for the most part disallowed. And so it was difficult. And I was kind of a questioning questioning kid by nature, I think. And I think since there was a big gap between what was said to be true and what was emotionally true, 
And so that uh, put me on a path towards questioning and challenging things at a pretty young age. I left all that and went to college and stepped into a very different world um, in doing so. And, and then it's a longer story that we won't go into right now, but had a spiritual experience in the context of the death of my fiance and grandfather on the same day when I was a sophomore. Mm -hmm. And dealing with all of that, um, my life ended on that day, um, March 6, 1982. And in dealing with that, I began to become an authentic person in my own way for the first time. I became a very serious student. I had questions that were burning inside of me. I needed to know what was true about the value of life the value of our lives, the value of other lives. Um, what are we on this planet for? So that drove me into seminary at Princeton and I ended up getting a Master of Divinity. I was planning to get a, a one-year degree in theology or one-year training in theology and philosophy of science and then get a, a PhD in psychology and theology. But loved seminary and stayed and got a three-year Master's of divinity and went very deep into theology and philosophy of science and convinced myself then that science was not the tool of the devil, but it was actually a wonderful thing and went to med school after that. And med school was a great uh, opportunity for me to continue integrating both the very practical um, hands-on world that I grew up in, but also continue my interest in ideas and reading and and psychology and theology and science. So that was a great journey for me. And I used education to pursue my questions and to heal from the past and to end up with a really different view of the world. And then did residency at Harvard in psychiatry. And then upon graduation was asked to take a faculty position. And it was within months of taking that faculty position and uh, taking a medical directorship role at McLean Hospital that a woman named Nicola, I call her Nikki, came into uh, my office and said that she was an oncology nurse at Mass General and had just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And she asked if I would help explain her diagnosis to her son. Pancreatic cancer is a terrible diagnosis, as you know. It tends to have a brutish, short, very painful ending mm -hmm. once a person's diagnosed with that. Uh, she went to a healing center in Brazil and began to call and write saying that she was seeing some amazing recoveries and was starting to feel so much better herself and asked if I would be uh, willing to look at some of the healings that she was observing. I said, no, <laughs> I didn't think it was likely that anything was going on. She was very persistent. She thought with this dual background that I have in medicine and theology, that I might be able to, um, understand some of this phenomena. So she was persistent and started to have people eventually, um, send me their medical files and send me these written copies of their stories or the um, typed um, stories. And, and I began to look at them and most of them, I could fit into an explanation that made sense based on my medical training. But there were some stories that made no sense to me and the medical evidence suggested that something had happened, but I had no way to understand how that had happened. And so long and short of it is, Thanks to Nicola, I ended up uh, starting this research with some resistance, but uh, have now been doing this now for close to 18 years and it's been a life-changing journey for me. I've had very strict criteria. Number one, the person had to have medically indisputable evidence of an incurable illness. They had to have clear medical evidence for accurate diagnosis and clear evidence for recovery. And then there had to be no other good explanation for how they could have gotten better. In other words, there could not be an experimental medication or something else that they had taken that could potentially explain their recovery. So that helped my skeptical mind um, in terms of just 
making sure that we were really limiting any explanations from chemotherapy or from certain kinds of medications or anything like that. For example, if the person is just a really good responder to medication or something. Mm -hmm. So um, CURED really looks at a lot of illnesses for which we don't have good explanations or hopes for recovery in our current Western medical paradigm. And then to interview these people and begin to understand the factors associated with their recoveries was just so, it turned my thinking as a doctor on its head in so many ways. And I was such a slow learner over the years because it took me so many years to begin to truly see these situations differently. And in Cured, I try to walk through that because at first I thought, well, so is this nutrition? Is this changing their relationship with stress? Are they healing their immune system in some way? What's going on here? It's, it's very confusing and it's, it's very complicated research in the early years for me because to make sure that I had just clear cases with no complicating factors took a lot of winnowing through data and stories. Um, and there's so many people who thought they were getting better but actually weren't when you look at the data. It's a complicated thing. And so it took me a long time to begin seeing with clarity some of these factors. But when you interview people, all these people, you know, well over 100 people, you go deep into their lives and deep into the medical evidence, and you start to see these same factors appearing in these interviews over and over and over again. You start to see patterns. I'm sorry to say that as a physician, I've had to deal with the fact that I was never taught really to help people heal so much. I was taught to make a diagnosis and start a medication, but we are at the end of an era of diseases and medications. We are just now in the very early stages of a whole new era where we actually study how people heal and we actually begin to talk about things like well-being and where you can talk about well-being or even spirituality without putting your career or your academic affiliations at risk. Mm -hmm. And so that's new. Yeah. Even, even five or 10 years ago, one's academic career could be jeopardized by talking about such things. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry to say that as a physician, I wasn't even taught to think about how people heal. Mm -hmm. and I think what, I think what stood out to me um, through the different case studies is that each person's path to healing was different. It wasn't exactly the same, like what you kind of talked about, what worked for one person didn't necessarily work for the other, but they, you did find similarities amongst the cases, That's right. but it was one, no one way fixes everybody. That's right. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's not, you can't just follow these steps and think that you're going to get well. I specifically tell the story that Claire told, for example, I start off here talking about Claire who recovered from her pancreatic cancer. And one of the things that she learned very quickly was when she put up her website about livingwithpancreaticcancer.com, which I think is just this treasure trove of great resources. Mm. And, but she initially put up exactly what she did with her nutrition and person came up to her and said, well, I'm going to do exactly that and did that. And then she still died. And then mm -hmm. Claire began to realize that it's not one size fits all when it comes to mm -hmm. healing. We mm -hmm. all, our bodies are giving us different messages and they're for us to understand and to decipher. And it's different from one person to another. And, and so it's, it's, there's definitely, patterns and factors that are common across many illnesses, but one dietary approach may not be the right dietary approach for another one. There's mm -hmm. principles that are relevant across mm -hmm. many dietary plans that mm -hmm. are unified at a deeper level, but uh, not necessarily, uh, you can't, it's not, it's just not one size fits all. One has to really pay attention to what's right for them. What I loved about Claire and her story really was it wasn't even an intentional 
path she was going towards. It was more of an unintentional um, path of healing because really she was just going to get her affairs in order and maybe, you know, try to figure things out so she could live the end of her life good. And it was through making these changes that yeah. ultimately healed her. Yes. Yeah, it's really true. She knew she was going to die in a matter of months. She was offered surgery, but she read about the Whipple surgery, which is a devastating abdominal surgery, takes out several body organs or part of bodily organs and part of your intestines. And she wasn't sure that she wanted to live with the side effects of that for the time, since it was only going to lengthen her life by a few months at best anyway. So, and she decided that for her, this is a lady who always valued science and doctors and the medical approach, but she decided if she only had a matter of months to live, she wanted to focus on quality of life rather than sitting in a dark doctor's offices with other patients who were dying. Mm -hmm. So she wanted to focus uh, her time with the people she loved and spend her time there instead. And you're right. She expected to die, but she wanted to finish well. And so she began to pay attention to the old grudges that she'd carried in her life, especially with one person who they had a close relationship in many ways, but she had felt this person had been very critical of her. And she decided she needed to do a lot of work around what it means to forgive this person and forgive herself. And she began to make nutritional changes. And she read an article that salt is bad for the pancreas. <laughs> and she got rid of salt, you know, and so it was this one step at a time. Right. And that was in 2008 and time began to go by. And then in 2013, she had a, an abdominal CT for unrelated reasons and was shocked as were her doctors that the cancer was gone. It's amazing. It is amazing. It is. What, what I thought about when I was reading about Claire was just a month, all, the most, all of the stories really, but it's just as far as your book in general, what I felt was it was a wake up call. Your yeah. book is like a wake up call. And the quote that I kept thinking about, we've all heard, and it was letting go of everything that weighs you down. Yeah. And I kept thinking about that, you know, all of those things that are weighing us down letting go of those things like Claire did and just letting go of unforgiveness and maybe resentment, all of these things that free your mind and free yes. your life and improve your health, but also letting go of those things that make us sick yes. and being willing to make those changes, whatever it is, whether it's dietary or lifestyle, it's just a combination of things. And that's really what I was gathering from your book, that it was just more about self-awareness and self-reflection and kind of a call to action for us to address our life. I mean, what are we doing here? What, you know, are we doing things that add value to our life? Are we living it with meaning? Is this, are we getting out of life what we really want to? So that's kind of what I got from your book as a whole, um, that made it so powerful to me. Mm. I think that's a really massive issue you're raising. I, I believe that in many of our illnesses, it's really a message from the deeper self or the deeper soul about something that's out of balance in our lives. And I, I believe in many cases, the our life gives us messages about these things. And I look back at my life and I see how deaf I've been many, many times and how long it took for me to start understanding that there is something out of balance in my life mm -hmm. and how those signals or symptoms had to get louder and louder before I would actually pay attention. I think sometimes that happens with our physical illnesses too. The body is a message or even a metaphor for something that the deeper self is trying to learn. And when we can learn to pay attention to that and realize there is this deeper part of us that is needing attention, uh, whether we're taking too much care of others and not paying attention to our own need for authentic well-being. Those mm -hmm. kinds of things are a big deal. My friend Gabriel Mate writes a, a beautiful book called When the Body Says No. And I think it's such a really clear understanding of what happens when we don't know how to say no to the perceived need to take care of others or 
to respond to the expectations we think others have of us. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how many times people will receive a life-threatening diagnosis and they'll be terrified at one level, but it's so common that a person will almost be or just even be relieved at another level. It's like, oh, well, if I have 12 months to live, I guess I can do what the hell I want to do with my life. I don't have to I don't have to be this kind of person for my mom or my dad or my spouse or or I don't have to go to law school. Um, I can do what I want to do with my life. And that that so strangely that death to the expectations of others can be the doorway into a more authentic life where the person doesn't need the illness in the same way. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. fascinating how how deep this stuff goes sometimes. It really is. And I think well, that's kind of what I was gathering from your book in the sense of like, sometimes we create these prisons for right. ourselves right. and then maybe receiving a, a terminal diagnosis or something awful. It's like we feel all of a sudden we're breaking free out of this prison to right. do what we want, to live how we want, to go where we want. Yeah. And I think that's really what this book does for us it's kind of like that wake up call to like hey let's let's analyze this maybe before something happens and you know maybe try to really start living the life we were meant to have yes um i have to tell you as i was preparing for this interview i watched one of your interviews i watched several but one of my favorite ones was with jill bolte taylor yes right oh my goodness i had watched her TED talk years ago of the stroke of insight, which I found amazing that this neuro anatomy anatomist had a stroke herself and she was describing what she was going through during the actual stroke. I mean, it was just incredible. Um, So she, that was incredible. But one thing that she said that I felt was relevant here was that in 22 years, nobody had asked the question of her how how did you completely reverse the stroke that was maybe meant to leave you permanently disabled or even die? Nobody right. asked those questions until she met you. And I just thought that was incredible. And kind of like the foundation of your book, it's like learning, why aren't doctors asking more of these questions about these spontaneous remissions or how people are naturally hearing healing? It's, it's not being asked. I found like that was really relevant to... Uh, you know, what you kind of talk about in your book. Yes, it's a great story, isn't it? Because Jill Bolte Taylor, she's this amazing woman. She, uh, you're right, she's a neuroanatomist who had a stroke and then she had a full recovery from her stroke. And you would think as doctors, we would want to be all over that and want, want to know how did she get better from her stroke? She had a major part of her left brain taken out in the stroke. And who better to talk about something like this? And this is somebody who has a best-selling book in something like 28 or 30 languages. She's been named by Time Magazine in 2008 as one of the most important people of the year. She had a TED Talk that was the first TED Talk that ever went viral. So it's been- It was awesome. Yeah, and so here's this. And you know, Oprah's been putting together a movie on her life and she's really, really prominent. And yet no doctor has ever asked her how she got better from her school. Right. <laughs> and right. it's fascinating. It's, that's, that's astonishing. It is. <laughs> yeah. And so I just thought it, and, that, and that's cool of you, you know, like your inquisitive mind and your diverse background and willingness to dive into these spontaneous remissions. I just think it all kind of came together for me. I'm like, wow, this is great. You know, this is great that you're talking about this. Um, Well, when we talk about spontaneous remission from a disease that's meant to kill us, um, what do you, what do you define, I guess, as spontaneous remission? And really was it that these people, because in the book you talk about maybe some of them did try to go through those traditional therapies and, and that. So what do you really mean by spontaneous remission? It's a great question. Spontaneous, the word spontaneous means without cause. And in med school, you look at spontaneous remissions, but we were taught that spontaneous, these things just occur out of the blue. They have no medical or scientific value. They just occur out of the blue. So they're not of any value. Well, that's not true. Everything has a cause. Mm -hmm. In this case, we just never had asked. We just assumed that it was a fluke and there's massive medical and scientific value. We just did not ask the questions. And so 
that's one way of looking at this. Uh, now, if you are on the science side, you call these events, whether they occur in 10 hours or 10 years, you call them spontaneous remission and you are taught that there's no medical or scientific value. If you are on the spiritual or religious side, you call these miracles or spiritual healing. But from my perspective, all of these terms are black boxes that have never been unpacked with the tools of science to understand. Mm -hmm. We were taught that spontaneous remission is rare. Well, it's not rare at all. It's much more common than we're taught. It's just that Doctors don't publish about it because they don't want to hurt their reputation. And they kind of screen them out of their awareness. I have interviewed so many people over the years, and I've talked more superficially with people about their stories over a thousand cases, but I haven't had time to go into every case because it's very time consuming to go so deep into these cases. Not one, I've asked many times, and, but not one patient has ever had a doctor who expressed interest in what they changed or how this happened for them, which is astonishing to me. It just shows that how powerful the socialization is into our current medical model and a perspective that in some ways is brilliant, but very limiting in other ways. So the best that a doctor will say, the really good ones will say, well, whatever you're doing, keep doing it because it's working. Right. But, but they're not curious. Right. <laughs> so, right. I mean, I don't want to do it, but I mean, I'm glad it's working for you. <laughs> so we need more curiosity. Right. Right. Well, I love the story you talk about in your book, of the guy that had the stomach cancer that went in for a gallbladder surgery or something. And he had told them and they said, yeah, good story, buddy. And then he found out that, wow, I mean, he really did heal himself from gastric cancer, which nobody tends to make it out of that Right. Very easily. Anyway, I found that fascinating. Um, and that doctor was like, oh, right. there is a little more to this. He's not lying to me. So right. that, that right. was good. That was good. Um, that was a doctor who was curious because then he went on and tried to really investigate that yeah. and ended up founding a whole new approach at NIH, the National Institutes of Health, that we now call immunotherapy. And so he's trying to boost up the immune system instead of what we more historically have done, which has been to shut down the immune system with antipyretics or immune suppressants and, and that sort of thing, he began to start a whole new path where we try to strengthen the immune system. And that's a much better step. That's actually what I was going to jump into. Was that the Dr. Coley that you were talking about, his findings? I can't uh, no. They're, but they're all kind of like, I, I just, I wanted to talk with you about his right. findings and, um, how well you talk about the immune system. I think we throw the immune system around like, Oh, it's immune, you know, but really you went into such great detail about it. And um, I thought you could talk about that. Like what this doctor found, like what, how we were traditionally, what we were traditionally doing to the immune system, yeah. um, which we still do at times with steroids in that. Um, but really the power of a fever or some of those other things, um, how it may actually benefit us to get the immune system fired up. Absolutely. Yes. Dr. Coley, it's a, it is a great story. Back around the 1920s, I believe, he was very uh, chagrined and experienced a lot of grief around a patient of his who died at a very young age, I think 19 or 20 years old of sarcoma, of a bone cancer. And he just was really upset that somebody so young and so healthy would would succumb so quickly to this cancer. And he began doing some research on this and found in the library some medical files where some people had recovered from sarcoma after they had spiked a fever and uh, began to look into that and doing some experimentation and started to have some success with uh, promoting an infection that caused a fever in some of his patients who then the fever would fire up the immune system and these brilliant immune cells would kick the cancer out. Now, maybe I should explain a little bit. We, the immune system is a massively important part of our body. There's all these brilliant cells and cell subtypes in our bodies that are part of the immune system that keep out not just infections, but they're what kick out the mutating cells that become cancer. Um, when a person gets, um, heart disease or um, diabetes 
or autoimmune disease, those are, those are autoimmune illnesses. It's not just diabetes. It's not just heart disease or not just an auto, autoimmune disease. These are immune cells that are confused and working incorrectly and attacking the body itself instead of what they should be attacking. And so a lot of the energy is absorbed into the body attacking itself in a way that creates chronic inflammation. So I think the future of medicine will begin to see, because the research around this is very compelling, but it takes more than 30 years for lab science to move from the lab to clinical practice. Mm -hmm. The science is very clear that people do not have a heart problem, a diabetes problem, a high blood pressure problem, a cancer problem, or an autoimmune problem, et cetera. They have a chronic inflammation problem at a deeper level. And if you can heal the chronic inflammation in your body, that's going to go a long ways towards healing the illness that a person often is suffering from. When I was in med school, we were taught that, oh, your problems are all genetic. And if you have a disease that has a big genetic basis, well, now we know that genes are turned on and off many times by lifestyle and by how we manage stress, by nutrition, by all these other factors. And so it's not genes as much as the lifestyle choices that we're making. So 80, 85% or more of the illnesses that people suffer from are lifestyle illnesses and not these genetically based illnesses that we were taught. So, and these, these illnesses are chronic inflammation underneath the organ that's, that's if, you're, if your heart is ailing, then it's often chronic inflammation that's throughout your body and your heart is just the first organ to express the problem. And there's gonna be more organs following, if that makes sense. So this immune system is a really big deal. In the United States, during this pandemic, we are being exposed as being the sickest country in the world because we treat our immune systems so poorly. Mm. And the research is very clear that the people who are struggling with COVID or dying from it often have chronic inflammation in their bodies that's causing these other comorbidities. And it's not that it's not just a simple thing that COVID is killing them, it's exposing a pre-existing problem and making it worse. Mm. And that's why I just really want to get a national discussion going about all these other factors to heal your immune system so that you don't even have to worry about COVID in the same degree. We're putting all of the weight of our response to COVID on three tools, pretty much masking, uh, quarantines and social distancing. And there's all these other tools that would allow us to have so much more freedom if we just would pay attention to them. But it's hard to get a national discussion. There's a growing group of people who are becoming mm -hmm. aware of this and more healthcare providers, um, NPs and doctors and nurses are becoming more aware of this and nutritionists really are as well, mm -hmm. but it's not anything close to a national discussion yet. It's amazing. Uh, the immune system is so affected by our environment, yes. what we're putting into our bodies, and even how we talk to ourselves, treat ourselves, the way we think. Um, and it's this combination of things that weaken our immune system. Yes. Yet it's so hard to, as you probably noticed, get people to really make those lifestyle changes. I mean, it, it is difficult. Um, and I think it's difficult because they don't really understand, like you said, that ultimately it's this chronic inflammation that is going on in our bodies. And that's what ultimately is killing us. Yes. And I think there's so much misinformation. This is, yeah. I mean, people are innocent in terms of, we just can't blame ourselves for this because the doctors and nutritionists that I work with are dying of the same diseases. And they mm -hmm. also don't know how important nutrition is or the, or how important managing one stress is, or all these other things that we're talking about. The fascinating thing is I was taught such misinformation about nutrition in medical school. Mm -hmm. I was taught actually the opposite of what's true. I was taught, I remember where I was sitting, I, we were taught, our professor said that people in the United States and the Western countries 
do not suffer from malnutrition. They suffer from overnutrition, and that's what's causing the obesity. That's what I was taught. That's actually completely upside down. What is true, and it's these individuals who figured this out because it's tragic that the medical profession and even nutritionists often are taught misinformation, but eliminating processed foods, cutting down sharply on sugar. And I'm not saying completely. I mean, every person makes those decisions differently, but it's important to understand that a hundred years ago, the average person ate four pounds of sugar a year. The average person in the United States eats 154 pounds of sugar a year. So what we might call normal is not even remotely normal. It's so off the charts of what our body was built to handle from a standpoint of evolutionary biology. And so just to begin getting a perspective around these things and then starting to realize how much your body and mind wake up and feel better when you start to eat healthier foods and that your taste buds wake up because you're starting to get better tasting foods and the trifecta of industry and academics who are paid by industry to get the results in the studies that industry wants and then how that interacts with the lobbyists who go to government and make recommendations about what kind of foods are recommended. That's a really complicated trifecta that's created a lot of misinformation about nutrition. And there's a lot of stories I could tell about that, but that's why those of us in the medical profession are so confused ourselves about what genuine nutrition is. Right, right. Um, I wanted to kind of get into that nutrition aspect a little bit, just so that we can start talking about, you know, what you talk about as far as the four pillars of health and just creating um, a healing bodily environment to where we are less vulnerable to disease. Right. Um, and you do a great job talking about nutrition in that chapter. And I thought, you know, you mentioned sugar and I love how you describe what sugar really is doing to our vessels. So maybe you could talk about that because I thought, wow, if people realized what it's really doing, cause you hear sugar's bad for you, but you're like, okay, yeah, right. You know? Right. Yeah. So what sugar's doing is it. I mean, there's a couple of things that as I, you know, you, what's happened for me is I've listened to these stories over and over and over. I get drawn into a different world and a different way of seeing the world. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things is it's like these things get unveiled to you because I knew for years as a physician, what we do is if a person is, if we're concerned, they might have cancer, we will give them a radio labeled glucose, inject it into their body, and then use a scan CT scan or or MRI and look to see if there's any part of the body that's sucking up the glucose, the sugar, because cancer loves sugar. And, and so if there's a place in the body that's really sucking up the sugar, then you have to look at that more closely and ask if that's cancer. Well, I knew that, but it never made sense. It never crossed my mind that, well, yeah, if you got cancer, do you want to consider cutting down on the sugar, cutting down on its nutrient source? And, you know, those kinds of stories when I would, when I talked to Pablo, for example, in London, and he was diagnosed with glioblastoma multiforme, a terrible brain cancer of which there's not thought to be any survivors. And he said, well, I'm going to starve my cancer of sugar. And, you know, years later, he's still alive. <laughs> he's adopted this keto diet and, and, um, you know, he had to do it under medical supervision. He was really careful about how he went about it to make sure he got the vitamins and supplements he needed. But that did just never crossed my mind that sugar can be that way. And you're right in their, in our blood vessels, sugar kind of careens through these blood vessels and it makes these little cuts. And, you know, if you get cut in the same place over and over again, you get this, the, the immune system comes in, tries to repair these same sites over and over and over again. And it creates this kind of little, not a welt, but it creates these little places of scarring and tissue and it starts to narrow your arteries. And that is chronic inflammation that's developing and narrowing your arteries. And, you know, I was taught in med school that this is a cholesterol problem. Well, at a more superficial level it is, but at a more fundamental level, the cause is the chronic inflammation that's created either by the sugar or the poor diet or by the way we are relate ourselves to stress. And that's a whole nother topic that physiologically is um, worth understanding, but yes. So yeah, sugar is a careens through our blood vessels. It's making these little cuts that then have to be repaired over and over. And, 
and the immune system just keeps repairing these things and creates inflammation around it. So it's, I just, it's unbelievable how much sugar we consume. It's yeah, it's a lot. And it's good to know really what it's doing to our vessels. You look at high blood sugar and, you mm -hmm. know, eventually it, you know, with diabetics, I mean, it, you know, they can't feel their, you know, they have poor circulation and it's just right. damaging their nerves and everything. So it right. is important. Um, what other things do you recommend as far as nutrition? What have you learned? And you kind of talked about it in the book, but if you could just talk about, you know, what you thought your thoughts are. Yeah. And again, you know, we've talked about how it's not one size fits all. We all have different microbiomes. We have different right. guts that have through the ancestry that we inherited from our grandparents and our parents, et cetera. We come from different parts of the world and have cultivated over hundreds of years, um, different physical needs when it comes to nutrition. And, and I purposely tell in Cured a variety of stories to show how different approaches work better for different people. But I also tried to make the point that underneath the superficial differences, whether it's a keto diet or a plant-based diet, vegetarian or meat diet, whatever, that there are really similarities at a deeper level. And so most of the individuals I spoke with uh, gave up processed foods by and large, not maybe completely, some did completely, some did mostly, but not completely. I mean, I purposely told the story of people like Claire who would go have a birthday and enjoy the cupcakes and all those kinds mm -hmm. of things but, or pizza, but, um, but they, they eliminating something 95% is a massive biological change. It, it's a, it's a massive change, to the biochemistry of your body. So it's, it's, you might not initially think you are any different for eat, not eating something versus eating something, but it is biochemistry wise, massively different. So eliminating processed foods, sugar for the most part, uh, refined flours, uh, the white flours, you know, that sort of thing. Most wheat bread is actually refined flour. And so you have to really pay attention to not what the packaging says, but to what the fine print in the ingredient says. But refined flour is basically sugar. It's 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 basically broken down into this into its glucose structure so quickly that it's basically sugar. And so the refined flours, um, a lot of times the white rice needs to be taken in. Um, certainly reduced, reduced amounts or moderation, uh, because that's also very closely related to sugar. So the processed foods, sugar, uh, refined flours, those are the big ones. Uh, some people gave up meat completely. Actually, 88% of people I studied gave up meat completely. Some people also gave up animal products, but not everybody did. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, Pablo, like I mentioned just a few minutes ago, he went more of the keto route and that's worked for him so far. I think the research is still out in terms of what are the long-term effects of keto. There's a lot we don't know. Most of the people that I know who consume a keto diet don't pay enough attention to the quality of the fat or protein that they eat. And I think that's a massive issue. Mm -hmm. um, Grass-fed beef, for example, has a lot more omega-3s than the more unhealthy fats of grain-fed beef. And the grain-fed beef is also often loaded with the antibiotics that are given to the cattle to promote weight gain, which, you know, whatever the, you're putting into the animal, it, you're putting into the your own body. And if, so if you're putting antibiotics into the animals, then you're putting those same antibiotics into your body and it's gonna cause weight gain in you if it's you being used for weight gain for the animals. And there's all kinds of other steroids and other um, chemicals that are often in much of the meat that people eat. And so, and I think also the way animals are treated, if an animal is living in really stressful conditions and, you know, like chickens are living in little cages where their beaks are cut off so they don't peck themselves to death mm -hmm. and those kinds of things, if they're, that means their body is bathed in stress hormones like cortisol mm -hmm. and norepinephrine and adrenaline. Well, and then so they're treated awful. And then you put those same stress hormones into your body. There's all these issues around things. So I tell people if they're going to eat meat to eat animals that were happy when they were alive mm -hmm. and not pumped full of chemicals, grass fed. So you get the healthier fats, 
and that can move things in a much healthier direction. And also make sure that you get plenty of plant-based food if you're gonna eat meat, because we know that meat is inflammatory. And the last thing people in Western culture need is more causes of inflammation in their bodies. Plants are anti-inflammatory. And so if you're going to eat meat, then at least make sure you're getting the anti-inflammatory plants to offset the inflammation that can be associated with the meat. Wow, those are such good points. That is such a good point, especially about the animals, you know, not even thinking about their stressful environments. And right. wow, that's powerful, really, if you yeah. think about it. Um, well, you do a lot of talking about stress and the stress response. And I thought you could talk about this chronic stress and what it's doing to us and, you know, why it's so important about how we react to it and how we handle it and how it can really benefit us in that stress response. Yeah, it's a really big topic. And it's very true that in Western culture, we have evolved a culture that at this time is very stressful much of the time. A person can sit in rush hour for a long time every day. That can be very stressful. There's the press of bills. There's the press of what the children need. There's the press of what's expected of a person or what one perceives is expected of a person. There's all of these things to manage and we fill our days with more and more things and um, more and more expectations that don't always feed the deeper self or soul of who we are, the more authentic self. And, and so what that does to the body at a physiological level is if you are bathing the beautiful cells of your brilliant immune system day in and day out with cortisol, with other stress hormones like norepinephrine or adrenaline, we know on the basis of really clear research that that causes the cells of your immune system to become sluggish and confused and to not only create inflammation, but cause those cells to be misdirected and to begin making mistakes. And so that's how cells in your immune system can begin attacking your own body instead of saving their energy to attack a true invader or pathogen, whether it's COVID or, or something else that comes in. And so it's a really fundamentally different biochemistry to have the cells of your immune system bathed in stress hormones than it is when they are bathed in the more parasympathetic hormones whether it's oxytocin, which is the love molecule, or serotonin, which is the antidepressant molecule, dopamine, which is the pleasure pathway. I mean, these are really different chemistry in our body. And when our immune systems, when our immune systems are bathed in these cells, it's a really different physiological effect. And you know, the parasympathetic mode is opposite of the sympathetic fight or flight or freeze response. Mm -hmm. Parasympathetic mode is the healing mode. That's when your immune system is kicked in and it wants to heal. So you wanna be spending some time where you find ways to relax, to really value who you are as a human being, to let yourself feel compassion and unconditional love for yourself and for the people you love and really connect with yourself and with others because that's what allows the body to heal. And many, many people don't spend much time in that mode. The parasympathetic uh, uh, nervous system is a profound system. It's the vagus nerve that goes through the center of our body, connects with most of our organs. And when we kick the parasympathetic vagus nerve in, all of those organs begin to heal. What's fascinating to me is the vagus nerve goes up and, and it innervates. What, when we smile, that's the vagus nerve kicking in. When we uh, when our eyes sparkle as we make eye contact with somebody, that's the vagus nerve doing that. And so the more that becomes an authentic response that we are actually connecting with other people who we really, whether it's someone we pass on the street, we just have a really authentic smile and a genuine connection briefly, even that has a profound physiological effect. So we want to help people get out of the rigid kind of steeled, severe, stressed, sympathetic, frozenness or anxious anxious spot that people live in so that people can relax and connect with themselves and others and really kick in that vagus nerve so the body can heal. 
I think it's so, it sounds wonderful, um, but I think it's so hard when people are really in it because a lot of times you don't realize it or you don't think you can stop or you don't really know how to stop. I mean, I know with me, it was just, it was one thing after another, you just feel you're pulled in all different directions, then you're not sleeping and then you're eating poorly. And it's this huge, yes. you know, I don't know, it's just cascading out of control. You know, it's like, I found it so interesting how you talk so much about that vagus nerve. I learned so much about it. And really you talk about strengthening that vagus nerve, that vagus tone. And you don't, I never really thought of it that way. It's like, what are things we can actually do? I mean, in realistic time, when we're really going through it, what is going to benefit us the most? Yeah. And I think it's different things for different people. For some people it's dance, you know, just getting out there and letting loose, getting all that repression out of there and mm -hmm. just letting go. Uh, other people, it's a spiritual practice. Other people, it's yoga or meditation. I'm a runner. So exercise for me is a great way to get my body into a different physiology that's more healing. Journaling is a big one for me. Mm -hmm. Spending time with people I love and really connecting is a big one. So mm -hmm. everyone has to find the things that work for them. I talk a little bit in Cured about the loving kindness meditation and just going in within just even for a few minutes a day and just letting yourself relax and experience compassion for yourself, experience compassion for other people, even some people you might be having conflict with. Those kinds of things change the physiology of who we are and allows, it, it sets the conditions so that healing can occur more easily. It's not healing trying to occur uphill. It sets the conditions and we can't heal ourselves, but I do believe we can set the conditions because I think the body wants to heal. Mm -hmm. I think um, when you talk about those micro connections, I felt like that was really powerful for people to, to know because you think about loneliness. There's so many people that are lonely, whether they live alone or they're in relationships and they're alone. And I felt like you really brought to light the importance and the significance of these micro connections and the importance of it happening in person and you get, you benefit more when it's in person and you, you gave an example. I don't know if I heard it or read it in the book, but how, you know, talking on the phone to your mom or whoever is great, but you get more out of it when you're, you know, answering the door, having a, you know, connection with the mailman or whatever face to face or a neighbor or something. I thought that was powerful. Yeah, I think, I think we all need human contact. And it needs to be authentic, where we really let our hearts open and expand, and just enjoy the people in our lives and enjoy who we are in a way that we don't criticize, mm -hmm. that we don't judge ourselves or others. Mm -hmm. And I think one truth of life is that we can't give to another what we haven't given to ourselves. And so learning how to really see and experience the value of who we each are. And, uh, you know, from a spiritual level that we call that this, you know, experiencing oneself as the image of God, for example, um, but really seeing the value of unconditionally valuing who one is and not judging that or questioning that or beating oneself up for mistakes we all make mistakes and we all need grace to pick ourselves up and, and try again. But those kinds of things can really open our hearts to ourselves and others in a way that does change our physiology. Hmm. How is the way we talk to ourselves or treat ourselves? How does it really impact our health? I mean, you always hear, you know, your mind affects your reality or, you know, all of those different things, but how really, important is how we treat ourselves and talk to ourselves. What's really exciting is that for the past 20 years or more, the, the research is really starting to take this on as a legitimate question. Historically, there's been a deep divide between mind and body for so many centuries. And we can go into the history of that if you wanted, but the mind and the body were thought to be so separate with, that, with no interaction which is ridiculous when you think about it. You know, I think uh, um, common sense would suggest that yes, our minds and bodies are very interactive. I mean, you know, sexual arousal, for example, is a person can have a thought and it can be very arousing physiologically. Those kinds of things, there's all kinds of connections, but 
in medical school, especially historically, we were taught that there is no connection and there's still very, very powerful researchers who will get angry if you start to talk about a connection between the mind and the body and they will say that's not science. Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately, the psychologists and the physicians are starting to talk. The researchers on both sides of that chasm have now been starting to do research from their own side for years. And there's a many, many studies accumulating now on both sides of that chasm that's building these bridges from both ends and showing how deep and profound that connection is. It's a very deep connection and we're just still in the process of establishing that the connection is there and real and powerful. We have not explored that. We've not mapped that in terms of the complete possibilities there in any stretch of the imagination. I, you know, I didn't come from a very, you know, my mom was very negative, um, you know, which probably played into her illness in a sense, you know, just negativity and um, hard to see the positive in things, which kind of brings me into what you talked about as far as the negativity bias and always thinking negative and hearing negative and that we tend to actually look for the negative Mm. more. And I think that's so important even now with the media, how much negativity we hear. And you brought that up. It's like kind of their purpose is to really strike fear in us in a sense. Yeah. Well, I think the eyeballs go to a threat on the horizon, right? I mean, our our physiological wiring uh, from an evolutionary standpoint is you look for the threat on the horizon. So you see it in time so you can run or um, or freeze or fight, whatever you need to do. I mean, if there's a tiger up there on the savannah, you want to see that tiger before it sees you. Right. And you need to be hightailing it and you don't want to be asking how it feels or how you feel or anything. You want to be hightailing it. So that's a really important mechanism to have that gets turned on for short periods of time, but you don't want to have that mechanism or that biology turn on all the time, that fight, flight, or freeze mechanism. So it's an important mechanism to have, but media can exploit that because they might not be completely conscious of it, but what they know is that your eyeballs go to whatever is dramatic and scary. And so, you know, if you're driving by a car accident, are you paying attention to the sunset or to the tragedy that you're seeing unfold um, Mm -hmm. with a car accident? So that's wired into us biologically. The way that plays out with social media and with the television media is that 10 times more bad news is published than good news because that's just increases their stats and increases their advertising dollars and all those kinds of things. So it's a complicated thing. And I think it just shows that we're in the early stages of learning how to manage the internet and media in a way that actually helps and heals human life rather than destroys it at some level. And things are getting quite extreme now, of course, because now you know, the truth is, if truth is this big whale, the way things work is uh, these algorithms of TV or social media come in and carve off a piece of the truth, feed it to the demographic that likes that partial truth and wants more of it, and then slices off another piece and feeds it to a different demographic. But those are all partial truths and partial truths by definition are partially falsified, if not completely falsified. And so everyone ends up getting the the media organizations are are rewarded for the most outlandish and falsified at least partially if not completely falsified views and then those views are monetized and that gets even more extreme so so we have some real challenges around that but it feeds a lot of anxiety and fight or flight and we know that people who spend a lot of time with media uh, television or social media end up actually with less understanding of the real issues because those views are so falsified. Mm -hmm. And there's a gap, for example, the more a person spends on media or on television, the greater is their misunderstanding of what the opposite political party actually believes, for example. So if you spend a lot of time on MSNBC, or if you spend a lot of time on Fox News, then you're going to have a worse understanding of what real people on the other side of the political divide actually believe or think. And so you begin to lose our sense of the humanity of other people because most people don't live with these extreme views. They have much more common sense, middle of the road sorts of views, but those are not what you're seeing exposed. And it's all this fight or flight stuff that's activated over and over and to the point that now people can't even get an appointment a lot of times with a psychiatrist or a therapist because 
the media environment and the pandemic are driving the rates of our psychological pandemic to record levels and there's just not enough help available. And now children, I supervise emergency rooms, children are spending 30 days or more sitting in an emergency room waiting for a psychiatric bed because there's not enough beds. This is so preventable mm -hmm. and it's tragic that this is where we are. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it really affects people physiologically. And then, you know, I've taken care of patients in the emergency room and then even in the urgent care, I mean, this mm -hmm. news, it, it paralyzes them in fear. And yep. it, you know, the heart rates up, they're, they're just, you know, they're more depressed, they're anxious. Yep. I mean, it's sad. And all of that, when you think about those things contribute to illness, yes. inflammation. So it all <laughs> correlates. Right. But I just feel like lately, it has just been, you know, so negative and right. that we fail to see the positive. Right. We don't look for it, but yet there is a lot of positivity, but you, you do yep. have to look for it. And I think a lot of positive things are going on. Honestly, there's yeah. some books that I can recommend to people, whether it's um, uh, Abundance by Peter Diamandis or um, who's the person, uh, Pinker here at Harvard, who are better, or the angels of our better nature, I think, or something to that effect that's close to the right title that would get you to that book, uh, who show that the world is becoming less violent over the decades and over the centuries. We are becoming a less violent people. Uh, there is no golden age back there where things were less violent uh, that we sometimes think, we are becoming less violent. We're making lots of progress um, with poverty and with human rights and with democracy and respect for individuals and all these things that are slowly being able to come out of the closet. And lots of fabulous things are happening, but that's not what we are taught or what we see if you listen to the news mm -hmm. or spend a lot of time on social media. So I believe the world is getting better and more and more options are available and are life-giving. But that's why spending less time sometimes with media or social media not only is better for your body, it also will improve your understanding of what the real issues are and what the humanity of the people are who may you think are very different from you. I think also it will improve our relationships when we actually seek to understand that other person or their point of view, rather than just writing them off because they don't agree with you. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah I just wrote this article about Taiwan. You know, Taiwan is, was thought to be, they were going to be a hot spot for COVID because they're just across the strait from mainland China. They have a lot of interaction with Wuhan where uh, the COVID pandemic started. There's a very dense population in Taiwan. So it's thought they're going to be a hot spot. Well, they've had 10 total deaths from COVID since the beginning of the pandemic. They wow. never had to shut down their economy. So they never suffered the psychological or economic consequences that we continue to experience. And they're mostly living normal lives now. And, and they did this through doing it very differently. And it's the way they did this. It wasn't, they, they did some things around immune systems that are important to understand, but that were more targeted rather than just spread across the population where everyone has to quarantine or everyone has to do this or that. So that was different, but at a deeper level, they had been working for the last four years to upgrade their democracy for the digital era and they began to realize that the internet was tearing them apart. I mean, there was fake news being planted by Beijing. The two political parties were screaming at each other and couldn't listen to the other side and all these things. And so they began to use this in part, this program called Polis from Seattle, which instead of rewarding the most monetized and polarized and falsified views, it rewards the people who can build consensus among the most number of people and groups. Mm. And it turns out that, e that you don't have to try to change people's minds or get people to agree on things they have sharp disagreements about, whether it's abortion or something else, but you can ask, well, what are the subcomponents of this problem? What are the points we agree on? And it turns out that we all agree on so many more things than we disagree on. And so there's so much misunderstanding about what's really true for us. And, and so as we begin to become more mature as a culture in our ability to use the internet to protect and nurture human life rather than divide it and destroy it, 
we'll begin to see that there's so much more that we agree on than we disagree on and the misunderstandings will become less of an issue. You're so right. Um, also in your book, you mentioned towards the end of your book, you talk about, I mean, there is benefit to technology. I think we talk a lot about, you know, it's yeah. bad for us and it is in a lot of ways. I mean, I know your Amish upbringing, you probably think, wow, I mean, there was probably some positives to not living with the phone constantly in my hand or the TV constantly on. But then on the other side, the benefits of being able to measure our health. And I know we didn't, we talked a little bit about the vagus nerve, but um, we didn't talk about the measurements that you can measure to see how well you're doing with your improving your vagus nerves. But that's one way um, heart rate variability that it's a powerful thing, a tool we can use for our health. So there are positives that you do talk about, which is important to remember. Absolutely. And I, I do believe that this is all. I think that the social media and media, these are massively important and beneficial, but right now we're at an early stage of appropriating them. And so the benefits are mixed because we still allow the partial polarization or the falsification of things to rule way too much when the truth is we're all human beings. We have much more similarity in our views than we often realize, mm -hmm. even if the it's it's different. It's a much different in reality, I think. So fortunately, every day, people in their communities are loving each other and helping each other and doing things that are so loving and connected that it offsets a lot of the stuff that's going on in the big media markets or social media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had to, I felt like it was really beneficial to me is I just went in and just stop having following anything that had to do with anything political or anything. And it just brought me such peace because, you know, you do kind of get fed to you what you agree with, but then you see these comments and they stir up anger or you, you immediately want to like, you know, and it's like, no, you know, just turn it off, get away from it and you will experience more peace of mind for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, one thing I want to come at, I really appreciate uh, and your important point about positive thinking as opposed to fearful or negative thinking. But this is not just about positive thinking either, because a person can try to have positive thoughts. But if you have a lot of unconscious anger or hostility or repressed feelings or that, I mean, it's not just trying to have positive thoughts. It's it's about trying to eliminate the fear in one's life so that you can truly experience yourself in the world differently through something that's more loving and compassionate and open-hearted rather than closing down in fear or anxiety. So it's, it's, it's not just trying to have positive thoughts, although that's an important part of it, but there's this deeper part of that too about making sure that it's authentic to you, that it's not just trying to force something positive when the truth is you're really angry about what this person did to you. And so, right, right. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's true. It is hard, honestly, to overcome fear. Yes. Um, at times, I know I suffered with that, you know, a lot of my early 20s, just losing mm -hmm. my parents, you know, young and then... I'm going to do it. I don't, I don't want to die. So it is, it is hard to overcome fear at times. It really is for every one of us. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's where journaling comes in and also just paying attention to the things you've talked about, what you can do to encourage health and, you know, recognizing those things that are taking away health. And um, before we talk about a few other things, I wanted to just touch on real quick, the placebo effect, because you talk about it in your book, and I think it is so interesting to talk about. I had heard a, a talk about this man that went in and did knee surgery. And he said, even just, you know, making an incision or whatever he had mentioned, he said, people still got better and he didn't do anything different to their knees. I thought that was so interesting. And um, so if you could just talk about that a little bit, is it that we just want to believe it's working? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a great question. It's, there's so much we don't really understand about placebo yet. It's, it's factored into so many scientific studies because we know that it's a really powerful force that some people will take a pill and get better, even if it's a sugar pill. There's all these things around it about what a person believes. And we, for the most part, just try to keep it something we relegate out and account for in the experiment, but we don't study placebo much. So yeah. <laughs> it's like it's sitting right in front of us. So it's a fascinating thing. And what we know is that a big pill is a stronger placebo response than a small pill. Um, a 
blue pill has a different placebo response than a red pill. Um, it matters whether the person who gives you the pill is a kind and compassionate person of authority versus someone who you don't perceive as being in that role. If the person has a white coat on, that plays a role in the power of the placebo response. We know that placebos that are surgical are more powerful than pills. So there's all these factors, but the study you mentioned is fascinating to me. So knee arthroscopy is a very common surgery in the United States. And uh, it's commonly done because of a certain kind of knee problem. And what's fascinating is that the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the most prestigious medical journals published years ago, uh, that if you just do, if you put the person under anesthesia, uh, make a cut on the knee and then stitch it up, that the effect of that uh, sham surgery is no different than actually getting the surgery. It's so it's like, really? So, 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 so save your money. Just, <laughs> I don't know. Just, just have the doctor put you under, make right. it, actually give you some stitches and send you on your way. Right. I don't think the orthos orthopedic surgeons will like, like this study very much. <laughs> let's just, let's, let's hide that study. Right. <laughs> it's just so interesting to me. I just thought that that is interesting, but it all goes back to the power of our mind yes. and what we believe and yes. how we can take that and influence our, our health. Yes. Yeah, I think that the truth is uh, we all grow up with a set of true and false beliefs. We gather these beliefs from our parents, from kids on the playground, from teachers, from work colleagues, from friends, from partners and bosses. And we take in these beliefs. Some of them are true. Some of them are false. Some are conscious. Some are unconscious. And they're almost completely unexamined for many of us. And I have come to believe after listening to these stories for a long time, that these beliefs, if you have a mixed set of true and false beliefs, then you're gonna end up with a mixed set of results in your life, whether it's the results of your physical health or your life or your money, those kinds of things play a massive role. And as somebody who's been sitting in a hospital at bedsides of patients for many, many years, I can tell you, that how a person feels about themselves at a deep level, about their value, about the friendliness or lack of friendliness of the universe, or how, if they feel alone or not, these kinds of beliefs and experiences or perceptions have a massive role in our health, in what we experience in life, in what we feel motivated to change. Um, you have to feel like you have value and that you bring something important and good into the world before you're going to have the motivation to change something, for mm -hmm. example. And so this, all of these beliefs are really, really important. And mm -hmm. for the most part, we don't realize what an important role they play. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a person die who's, you know, an older person, say maybe they're 80 or, or, or whatever. And, and if their spouse then feels like, well, you know, what is there to live for at this point? The people of my generation are mostly gone. Life feels pretty awful every day. I don't feel good anymore. Food doesn't taste good. I don't really have much to live for anymore. Do I want to keep living like this? And it can be an unconscious or conscious sort of process, but it's so common that a person will then follow their partner shortly thereafter. And I just have seen that happen so many times and seen the way they respond to or interpret that death plays such an important role in what then happens for them. Mm -hmm. So beliefs are important. Yeah. And having a purpose in life and a will to live. I yeah. think it, you know, towards the end of your book, you talk about things that are associated with, you know, positive survival outcomes and negative survival outcomes. And I think, I think having a purpose is so important, but then again, you can also get kind of stressed out in that fact too. What am I supposed to be doing? You know, what, what what's my purpose? So I think it's more just simplifying that. And you know, why do I wake up every morning? What what is, yeah. what is meaningful to me? That's right. What really drives us? I think you're right. Purpose yeah. and intention is so important. I've so often seen a person receive a fatal diagnosis, and they will say something like, "Well, I'm not going to die until I see my daughter walk down the aisle," for example, and. But lo and behold, they will make that happen. They will they will do what it takes because that is their intention and their purpose is to get to that date. 
Mm -hmm. And so you're right. Purpose and intention. What we really want is so important. Mm -hmm. Now it cannot be imposed by someone else. You can't like a, if a woman gets breast cancer, it is not the right for a partner or a doctor to say, well, boy, just please do this or do that because I do not want to lose you. That's fine to do, but you want to do that in a way that leaves the person agency to follow their authentic urgings of their own intuition and to follow their own needs and decide for them because a purpose that wells up from deep within you um, that you really want is really different from trying to take on a purpose that someone else wants you to have. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really different thing because mm -hmm. I've seen some people receive a diagnosis and boy, life had been rough. You know, it'd been so traumatic. There'd been so many different things that they'd lost or people they cared about who had died or not been available to them. And they were tired and we just, it's just, a, it's a very individual thing and you have to let the person be free to have their own journey and path and so that whatever comes from them is authentic and deep rooted and consistent with what they believe is their path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've seen that too. You know, people, they're ready to go. Yeah. They're, they're tired. They're, you know, yeah. they've lived their life and, and it is hard for people to watch that, but you're right. It has to come from them. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that. Um, well, just getting back to your book and just kind of closing up overall, you know, we talk a lot going to Brazil and studying Brazil and these people going to heal in Brazil. Um, what was the differences in Brazil? What made Brazil special? What were your findings there as opposed to here? I mean, do we have to go to Brazil to get those you know, outcomes or, I mean, what was so different? I think what was helpful for me in the early stages of this journey was to be exposed to cultures that view reality really differently. And so, for example, to see a shaman do things, whether it's, uh, or to see a healer, you know, do, to take a paring knife and cut on a person's cornea, for example, and for the person, even a Westerner, to not even flinch when that happens, or to experience pain. Um, I mean, to see these things that from the standpoint of ordinary medicine and Western views of the world, weren't possible or didn't make any sense. And I began, that first began to open me up to realize, wow, the mind is really powerful. And mm -hmm. there's things that can happen that we would think are impossible from our ways of thinking. Now that was helpful in the early stages, but then to begin to see those kinds of things in our Western culture too, it was a, it was a, it's a different, it presents differently, but a lot of the same kinds of things can still occur. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I try to tell stories of people who had these healing experiences. Some saw healers in different countries with a very different view of the world. Uh, others saw healers in Western countries. Uh, some people saw um, like Dr. Namie in Cleveland, a physician who is also a healer. Um, and there's, some people didn't see a healer at all, mm. but it's, but I tried to make the point in cure that it's not really about the healer. The healer might facilitate some things, but it's all they're doing is, is facilitating what's already within you because we all have these magnificent possibilities with us that we're not even aware of. Mm. And so to become more aware of that and how to activate those, that's not about a healer. That's more about just realizing the mystery and the goodness and the possibilities of who we all are. Mm and realizing there's more to us than we thought. Yeah. How have all these findings and your research impacted and changed your own life, how you live life and view life differently? Well, there's probably a lot that could be said about that. I know if you look at pictures of me back when this research started, um, you know, I was, it's a longer story, but I was on Oprah in 2010, seven years after starting this research. And uh, the there was a film that had been taken against my will um, that filmed me at that time and was then sent to Oprah. And, you know, I was, what, 238, 240 pounds then. Mm. My numbers were starting to go up. I was doing the you know, busy lifestyle of a physician, taking care of a lot of others, clueless about what my own mind and body needed. And 
is through listening to these stories that very slowly I began to change what I put into my body, how I manage stress, how I think about myself, mm-hmm. begin the whole process of examining one's own conscious and unconscious beliefs and changing those. You know, I'm a different person now and the photos show it's a really different person. And physiologically, I'm a lot younger and these kinds of things have real world effects. So I'm a very different person than I was back then. And that's easy to see from, from photos and the way I thought about things. Mm. Mm, That's so good. Well, in your kind of final analysis of putting it all together, I'm going to draw from your Ted talk a little bit. Um, Is there anything spontaneous about spontaneous remission? Really? No. There's nothing spontaneous about spontaneous submission. Everything has a cause. Mm -hmm. We just need to ask the questions. (laughs) And ultimately, do you think our body has the, our mind has the power to heal our body? I believe that there are untapped powers that have yet to be mapped in the mind and the heart. And it's not just about the mind. I think the mind needs to be fundamentally connected with the part with the heart in ways that we feel things. It's one thing to think something. It's a whole nother level to think about something with feeling and to set an intention for our lives that we feel deeply uh, that sets into place a different physiology. The most important thing that people have said to me over the years in the context of their healing is that it took an illness for them to wake up and realize that they needed to stop taking care of everyone else They need to stop responding to the perceived expectations of others. They need to stop believing the bad things about who they are and begin to wake up to the dignity and value of who they really are and to not doubt that and to pursue things that really gave them joy and life. The Mm -hmm. things that put life into you are things that I think we are meant to experience and to pursue. And even if it feels selfish initially, you got to start looking at that stuff because it's a clue to who you really are and who you're meant to be. I love that. Well, um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. I've learned so much. I love your book. And um, I heard you say you're going to be writing a second book or are you writing a second book or what's the status on that? I'm starting to get, I'm trying to get some teachings put together online to go more deeply in each chapter because you know, my effort was to write a book that's accessible by everybody, whether it's a lot of education a person has had or none. And I think the truth is it's a long book. And so it's a lot of information. And so what people tell me is that they love these chapters and then they go on from one chapter to the next and forget about what they just read. And so I want to help people go more deeply into each chapter and integrate it into their lives so that they get the fullest, the fullest piece of all this. So. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that. Thanks so much for being here. I love talking to you. It's been great. Really a pleasure. Thank you.